In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grant unto thy people, we prayed a few moments ago, that they may love the thing which thou commandest. At first sight, it sounds simply as though we're praying God that we'll be able, more or less reluctantly, to put up with what he expects us to do. To accept a will that is perhaps imposed on us in a sense. We need to do what we have to do, according to God's will, with as much willingness, as much enthusiasm as we can muster, but we're going to need a bit of help in order to do it. Fair enough as far as it goes, but I wonder whether we ought to go a little bit deeper with that notion of God's command. In the epistle this morning from St. James, we hear about how God begets us with the word of truth. And that's a reminder that the very first command that God gives in the Bible is, let there be light. What God commands is that the world should exist. And when God first declares, let there be light, God says, let there be a radiating force from my own eternal joy and beauty reflected in a world. Let there be light, then let there be all the other things that exist. And let there be, ultimately, human beings. Let there be you and me. So I wonder, when we pray for God to help us love what he commands, whether we might not just extend it to that breadth and say, we're to love God's command that the light exist. We're to love the word of truth, which brings the whole universe into being with its reflection of the radiance and generosity of God. And that perhaps gives us a little bit of a key to some of the themes that run through this morning's prayer and readings. It's interesting that true and truth are words that echo through the collect, the epistle and the gospel. True joys, the word of truth, I tell you the truth, the spirit of truth. To love what God commands, to love God's creation, is to love the truth and to love in truth. To love the fact that we ourselves are brought into being as part of this great complex reality, which is the finite universe. We are invited by the word of truth into this living truth in which we're set. And the beginning of our wisdom, the beginning of our new life is loving that reality. Not trying to escape from it, not trying to isolate ourselves from the rest of it, not trying to dominate it, but loving it because it comes from God's word of truth. Loving the light loving the truth. Because what's wrong with us, the reason we need to pray for help in loving what God commands, is our habitual drawing towards untruth. The untruth of our self-sufficiency, the untruth of our unlimited power, and all the rest of it. All the things which we are so painfully familiar with in our daily lives and the life of our society. This morning we're praying to be delivered from that untruth. Praying to be reconnected with that creation of which our new life in Christ is the first fruits of renewal. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. For us, believing in the truth of Jesus Christ, for us, breathing in the gift of the Spirit, what's happening is that the truth, the reality of creation is coming to fruition. We are, in our new life in Christ, the beginning of a reconciled life for creation. That's the truth we are asked today to love. The Gospel takes us 
further still in a very dense, complex passage, even by the standards of these chapters of St. John. I tell you the truth, says Jesus, it is expedient for you that I go away. Because the relation we have with Jesus is not just a relationship with an impressive teacher that we love, another person within the world that we admire and seek to follow. Our relation with Jesus is that the truth that lives in him comes to live in us, so that he's not just an other to us, he is our life. In one sense, he's gone away as an object we can just relate to at a distance. He has become our very heart, the very center of our being and our energy through the Holy Spirit who gives to us what God the Father gives to Jesus. The spirit of truth, the spirit who points to the fact that in Jesus, God's purpose in creation is fulfilled, that in Jesus, there is light and truth. And the spirit therefore who tells us that in our life together, as a community of believers, united in love and trust and hope in us, creation is coming to its fullness. Truth and light are there to break forth. The spirit in pointing us to Jesus, the Jesus who lives in our own hearts, the spirit points to where it is that God's commandments are most fully loved and God's promises most fully desired. Pointing us to that life, Jesus' life, in which there is an absolute love of truth, a love of reality, and an absolute passion for the fulfillment of God's promise of healing and mercy for the whole creation. I said it's a complex passage in St. John's Gospel, but it's also, like all these passages in St. John, an exhilarating one. What an extraordinary picture it paints of the life within which we and our prosaic circumstances actually exist. Here we are declaring to the rest of the world that God's purpose is to generate light and life. God's command is that we be joyful, that we enter into fullness. That's what we declare. We say that that, as a matter of historical fact, comes to its point of crisis and realization in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. And we say that as a matter of continuing contemporary fact, the Holy Spirit brings that light, life, generosity, and hope alive in us. And that's the truth. That's where true joys are to be found. So today, our collect and our readings are inviting us to think about how we become more truthful. Not just how we become more habituated to avoid little social untruths, how we become habituated to get away from all those forms of self-consolation and self-protection that we live with, but how we become more visibly, more obviously in love with the world of God's creation, in love with reality, in love with that endlessly variegated truth that surrounds us, and so in tune with all that we can do, all that we can be, in order to live more fully into that complex reality, which is love and order, the order of the unruly wills and affections of sinful people, not an order imposed from outside, not an order that knocks us into shape, that takes us, so to speak, and molds us by force into an alien will, but the deep order, harmony, and mutuality that creation is made for. And just to make the obvious point yet again about where we are at the moment in the middle of the lockdown, it's worth remembering that for so many of us, 
this goes on being a moment of truth. Day by day, we have to go on asking the question, so what does actually matter to us? What does actually affect us most deeply? What do we care about? What do we worry about? And the only way we as Christians can really approach this is by continuing to pray that we will be given the spirit of truth, to see in and through this how we come more deeply to love what God commands, to love the reality God has made, and at the end of the day, of course, to love ourselves as part of that reality. Seeing ourselves just for a bit with the eyes of that God who has commanded that there be light so that there will be joy. The Easter season begins with the celebration of light, with the kindling of the new fire and the paschal candle. And in the weeks that follow Easter, we're invited to think about how that light kindles within us. Today, we're being told that what God commands is truly our very being, our life. And what God promises is the fulfillment of that life in true and lasting joy. The joy of mutuality, the joy of relationship and gift, that receiving and showing and returning which Jesus speaks of at the end of the gospel. There's our true joy, and there's the good news that we share for the world. In our current isolation, the paradox is, and we've thought about it quite a lot in recent weeks, the paradox is that we're invited to think more deeply about our connectedness and what we best do to make that connectedness work for love and for life. And so, stripping ourselves down to the truth, exposing ourselves afresh to the reality of what God has made, what God commands in bringing the world to be, and what God promises in holding the world in love to the very end. We are renewed, refreshed, receiving, says St. James, the engrafted word, the word of truth, which has become grafted into us, which has become second nature to us. Because as we grow as believers, that's what needs to happen. We need to find that kind of truthfulness about ourselves and creation has become second nature. Something that simply lives in us in all our words and deeds. A lifetime's work, we have no doubt at all about that. But also part of what God promises and leads us into. And for one last thought this morning. You've probably heard me quote before, and many other people quote, the great Welsh poet R.S. Thomas, a fellow Anglican cleric, of course. And one of his early collections of poetry was called The Bread of Truth. And he uses that imagery more than once of truth itself being like bread, being food, being what keeps us going, keeps us journeying. In one beautiful image, he imagines walking across the mountainous terrain of his parish, with the air crumbling about him like bread, as if creation itself has become a truth that feeds, and nourishes, and helps us grow. In the Eucharist, it's that bread of truth that we're receiving. We're brought into a life in which we can trust the command of God and love it, the command to be the command for light, the command for life. That word of truth, that engrafted word, is given to us yet again in the form of the bread and wine of the Eucharist. And although we're not sharing the sacramental elements this morning, we are sharing the living truth, which is our life. As we gather together, rejoicing in one another, rejoicing in the truth, finding where true joys are to be found and renewing our willingness, our urgent readiness to share that, to receive and to show as the Spirit does with Jesus, so with us in the body of Jesus. God help us to be witnesses of that divine command and that divine promise. With the word of light 
and life and truth engrafted in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.